We live in exciting times. The world is changing fast. When I want to find something out today, I pick up my phone, I ask it a question, and in an instant, I'm given an answer. Sometimes hundreds of answers. Information is all around us. Yes, the world is changing fast. When I was a kid, we didn't have cell phones. Of course, we didn't know what Google was. Many of us didn't have computers in our home. The thought of going to Mars, well, that was a mere fantasy. The thought of actually sending people to Mars to live? Unfathomable. Fast forward to today. We're actually talking about sending people to Mars to live. And cell phones and mobile devices are everywhere. And we're using them at younger and younger ages. Did you know a new study just came out? And in the United States, 38% of kids under two years old are using mobile devices. 38% of kids under two years old. Yes, the world is changing so fast. And to think, the iPhone was actually only invented and brought to market eight years ago. What's it gonna be like eight years from now, can you imagine? What about 18 years from now? Are we actually gonna have people living on Mars? It's an interesting and timely question. The other day, my family and I, we went to the movie The Martian. I don't know if you have or haven't seen it. I won't give anything away if you haven't. But it reminded me sort of of a modern-day castaway. Do you remember Castaway with Tom Hanks? He was stranded on the desert island. He had limited resources, and he had to try to find a way to survive. Well, in The Martian, Matt Damon is stranded on Mars. Same thing, limited resources. He's got to find a way to survive. What's he going to do? What would we do? Let's think about that for a minute. I'm going to challenge each and every one of you to think about that for a minute. Let's close our eyes and pretend the doors to this theater are closed. They're shut closed right now. We are all stuck in here. We're stuck in here for the next six, eight, could be ten months. What are we going to do? Whatever's going on outside is too dangerous. We don't have a choice, we're stuck in here. Well, as reasonable and logical thinkers, we're probably gonna to come together and start dumping out our purses, emptying our pockets. We're gonna collect all the water bottles that we can find. We're gonna find all the candy bars. We're even gonna collect the breath mints and the little morsels and crumbs, whatever we can find. And we're gonna pile them up and we're gonna to have to make some pretty hard decisions. We're going to have to make decisions on who gets what, why, how, when. How are we going to do that? How are we going to make those heart-wrenching decisions? So that little pile of resources that we've collected here, it reminds me of our education system today. You see, if I look at our education system today, it's like it's a, a scarce resource that we can't disseminate and give to everyone. Only some people get to access it, while others are denied. And I don't understand that in our world, why we're not educating all of our youth. You see, maybe one of the reasons is we're using pedagogies and curriculum of yesterday to try to teach innovators and problem solvers of tomorrow. We're using things from the past to create people who can think in the future. We're using old technologies to teach people who are gonna to have to use technologies we don't even know are invented yet. And what this is doing to our children, who are growing up with these technologies in their hands, is it's leaving them disconnected, disempowered, and disengaged. And I want to share a little bit with you of the stories that I've seen. Our kids are disengaged, and this is one of the biggest things that we hear. You probably heard it as parents, grandparents, teachers, coaches. Our kids are disengaging. They're bored. They're uninspired. And the results of this in education is that we're losing them. They're dropping out and walking away. 
In the province that I live in, one in four students is dropping out. We have the highest dropout rate in Alberta and Canada. One in four is walking away or dropping out. And if we look down to the United States, in Georgia, two out of four kids aren't graduating. Only 50% of kids are actually graduating. And I'm going to bring it back to Canada, a little closer to home. In our Aboriginal First Nations population, 38% of our kids are graduating. You see, education seems to be this valuable resource that we're, that we're not disseminating, and I don't get it. Because we're not going to run out of education. There's not a finite amount of learning. We can afford to educate everyone, and not only can we, we have to. Because we have to solve the problems of tomorrow. We have to find ways to, to meet the demands, kind of like in that simulation we just did, where we had to think about who gets what. I mean, when we wake up and come back to this room, it's a relief. We're here together. That's not really happening, but you know what it is? 5,000 kids die every day because of a lack of clean water. 5,000 children every day. Clean water, sufficient food, lack of energy and resources, these are problems that our youth have to solve. So we can't afford to have them disengaged and walking away. Our kids are also disconnected. A lot of times we, we see that they're disconnecting from the classroom, from what they're learning, and from the world around them. But they're even disconnecting from one another. So let me talk about that for a minute. When our students go into school, they put on their math hat and go to math class. And then they have to put on their language hat and go to that class. And then they go to art or drama, science. And these subjects stay separate and siloed. We don't make purposeful, deep, and meaningful connections. Yet we know that our brains need something to attach new learning to that makes sense to us. And so the power of Integrating all of these knowledges would really impact our kids in important ways. Things like math that seem so difficult for so many kids could be learned if we would just integrate math with other subjects and connect it to things in the real world around us so that kids understand that it's not just a formula or a rule, but it actually has a purpose. Now, not only are kids disconnecting from the subjects we teach. And math, let me tell you, that's one of the biggest ones. I get asked all the time, why do we have to learn this? When am I going to need to know it? So it was my challenge to try to figure out how to move past that. How could I connect math to something that makes sense to them in the real world? And one of the ways we can do that by, is not by embracing art and by embracing visual models and also, again, by providing context that applies it to the world around us. So we can connect the world outside of school to what's going on inside. It's critical. But the other thing that our, the other big disconnection that we're seeing in education is our students are disconnecting from one another. And this is what we're seeing in our headlines. When we see so many kids engaged in violence, or we see school shootings, or we see incidents of bullying, we can't have this. We need to unite and connect our, our kids so that they can be the global citizens that are going to come together to solve the real world problems that we have going on. We need authentic ways for them to collaborate, communicate, and learn. Not just in our classrooms, but in our society. So we have disempowerment, disconnection, and disengagement. We've seen firsthand as teachers what happens when kids are disempowered and they feel like they don't have value. We see firsthand increased incidents of violence, of students um, hurting themselves, cutting, making poor decisions, doing drugs. 
We see this as teachers. We see this, this is happening all the time, and it's actually increasing in our classrooms. And in fact, when play was removed from our curriculum, when we took play outside of the curriculum, we saw these incidents of this increase rapidly. And did you know here in Canada, we have the highest suicide rate of our Aboriginal people in the world. In the world. And this really, really hits home for me. Because I had a 13-year-old student who killed himself. And I made a decision. The education, from now on, I was going to spend all of my time and all of my power to make sure that our students were empowered by education, that they were ignited by education, that they were engaged and connected. Because we can't keep losing our talents. We can't have students hurting themselves, hurting each other, and walking away. We need all our citizens to join forces so that we can solve these real-world problems. And so, when I look at that and I think, well, what's wrong with our system? Why do we have so many kids disempowered, disengaged, disconnected? It's not an indictment on the teacher. It's so important because we as teachers, we're fighting that battle. When our students come in, we want to help them be successful. That's why we got in the game in the first place. We want them to be successful and we feel it when they don't. It's a system where we don't have the opportunity to do the things that we know would be the best and optimal for our students. One of the worst things we have to do is we have to keep things on a finite time limit. Now, we all know that our brains are wired differently. We all learn differently. We all have different propensities and aptitudes and things that get us excited. But we don't give students enough time to fully come through the learning process on so many things that they need to learn in the classroom. Because when it's the end of the unit, I have to move on. Can you imagine if we did that with everything? We had a time that you were allowed to learn something, and if you didn't learn it in that amount of time, you just had to move on? What if we said everyone who didn't know how to walk by the time they were one just didn't get a shot at it anymore? It makes no sense. Learning doesn't need to have a time limit. Learning needs to connect with our innate ways of knowing and doing and playing. So, one of the solutions that I've found is what I was saying about integrating our knowledge together. And that's where I found the world of STEM. You see, when I was first a math teacher, I remember walking into my class the first year, and I remember saying, okay, if you don't have 70%, you don't belong in this class. You gotta go to the class down the hall, the other math class. And then, if you didn't fit in the other math class, you were sent a little further down the hall to the other, other math class. And that's where I learned the most powerful lessons, because you see, I was the teacher who taught that class, and the class down the hall, and the class down the hall. And that is, where I learned the most powerful lessons on how to be a teacher and how to connect and reach each and every one of my students and the importance of time when they're learning. Because one day, I remember, one of the boys came to my math class late. It was like almost the end of class, and he showed up. And I was like, where were you? And he said, oh, I was standing in line all night at the big box store. Oh, yeah, but why were you doing that? Well, he said, some guy paid me 50 bucks if I would stand in line all night and buy him three video game systems. I can't remember which system it was. So he did. He stood in line all night, out in the cold, and he got his 50 bucks, and the first thing he did was come to math class. He walked from the other side of the city to, the math, to math class, and I realized it's winter. He was outside in his t-shirt and jeans all night, and he hadn't eaten. And so instead of saying, you know, well, you got a lot of catching up to do, I said, you must be hungry. He said, yeah, I really, I really am. So I said, okay, wait here. And I ran up, because I ran a, the breakfast program at the school, and I always kept extra food. So I went and got him some stuff. I brought it back to the classroom, and he started to eat. And because I taught the remediation class after, he was still in my class. And he wasn't really eating, and I was like, what's wrong? And he said, well, I can't really eat, it's making me sick. And I said, oh, you're not feeling good. No, he said, I've been living in a car 
for the last four months, and I haven't eaten much. So every time I eat now, it makes me sick. So I learned that day from those kids in that class that they're coming to school with all kinds of obstacles to learning. How am I going to put him on a timeline when he needs something else? So our education system needs to not be another barrier that these kids need to come up against. Instead, it's got to reduce the barriers so that all kids can plug in and engage. And so because I wanted to be a change agent, I tried to change my classroom. Not much success. It's really hard to change a system from the inside, I learned. So then I became a professor, and I thought, OK. And I did some really exciting research on kids who are at risk, especially in the area of mathematics. And I was so excited. I wanted to see these changes happen in schools, but the change is so slow to filter down to schools. And I got frustrated, and I decided to do the most logical thing. I quit my job. I quit my job and said, that's it, I'm going to change the world. My husband was so excited. <laughs> so now, now I'm ignited, because I get to create curriculum that's meaningful. I put play back into education. I give kids purpose, because I create and design activities where they have to solve a problem beyond themselves. And we know from research, when you're solving a problem beyond yourself, it's so motivating for kids, especially kids who are at risk, who are depressed, who are hurting, because they're contributing to the world in a valuable way. So I get to make these curriculum that in, in, involve play, but they also involve passion. You see, when a kid is ignited because they're doing something they love and are excited, they're really engaged, and they're not going to be the kids walking away. And so what we've decided to do is teach math through robots. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> and let me tell you, kids come alive because they're getting math without even knowing it. They're doing exciting problems where they actually have to take a robot as a platform, not just as a toy, but as a platform to solve a real-world problem. They have to bring in that element of purpose to create a robot that does blank. And then we teach them to develop apps and games so that they're not just consumers of electronics. So we need to engage all of our students in this. I ask you all to join me. Please, don't, please help me in my quest to make education a human right. It's not a scarce resource, and we have to give it to all of our kids. Thank you.